West Enders. West End, the best end, baby. 4101 for the home run. We in here today. Mumsy, if you're watching this, please select another West Enders video right now. I'm going to use the SEX word, which you specifically told me never to use, even in real life, let alone on the internet. I'm going to try to keep it as G-rated as possible. But we may start creeping over to the PG, possibly even the triple X, because we're talking about slow sex today with our resident sex genius, Louise Miranda. <laughs> Maybe sex witch. Sex witch? <laughs> I like that. That's really, really cool. Um, if you'd have a business card, what would it be saying at this point? I actually call myself an embodiment artist. I love that. I tried to do a little bit of research on slow sex before this. I initially thought it either meant sex uh, between really old people who are too old to actually move fast <laughs> or recorded sex that's just slowed down. Um, that's you, a good idea, actually. I, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. <laughs> Uh, possibly even combining the two ideas, like really, really old people having <laughs> yeah. sex and just put it in slow-mo. You know, that could possibly be used um, for whatever purpose, possibly in Guantanamo Bay to get information out of people. Um, can you give me a rundown on exactly what slow sex is? Slow sex is a little bit like slow food. It's this idea of changing the way that we connect with, first of all, ourselves and with one another and moving away from this really goal-focused or goal-based sex, which is pretty much where people come together and they're focused on either having an orgasm or giving somebody an orgasm as quickly as possible. Yeah. I think there is an inverse relationship between how quickly you achieve something and how much you appreciate it. I look at, uh, like these days, if you want social validation boom, take a photo, put it on Instagram, get a bunch of likes. You want food, get Uber Eats, enjoy it um, as quickly as you can. Um, you want to reach Climax, jump on Pornhub, get that. Yeah. You don't really appreciate the social validation or, or, or all the food, all the Climax, because it's just happened so quick. Whereas if you have you know, a whole day preparing a meal and then you eat that, you appreciate it so much more. If you're courting a partner, mm. you know, obviously that Climax is going to be a, a lot better for you. Um, how, how did this movement come to be? Where are its origins? Its origins are in my body. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> um, I, I committed to a period of cel celibacy about seven months ago. Wow. And throughout the course of the last 12 months, I did a, a big embodiment process. And that embodiment process involved doing things like giving myself a breast, mas breast massage every day for 10 minutes or giving myself... A for, for 10 minutes? Yeah. That's almost a bit meditative. It is a meditation, definitely. But the way that I view life is that almost everything is a meditation. Yeah. Once you are engaged, once your observer is engaged, then every single interaction, every single activity that you do has this quality of meditativeness about it. Yeah. It's a way of bringing light to a really important part of our experience as human beings. Mm. Sexual energy is life force energy. Yeah, absolutely. Everything comes from sexual energy. Yeah. Everything. Literally everything. That's why, Literally that's why we're all here. Yeah. Everything. And so when we have a constriction or a block or a barrier to being comfortable with a particular energy or an idea or a feeling or a, we, we do this thing of we unconsciously suppress it and that creates these tension holding patterns in our bodies as well. Yeah. And slow sex in general is a way of finding those things in our psyche and also locating those tension holding patterns in our body and releasing them. Where do some of these tension spots or holding patterns come from? A lot of it is shame. Most yeah. of us have a lot of shame around our sexuality because we grew up in a culture that where sex is this taboo thing. It's, it's like it's exiled from our common experience. There are only, you know, you can only be sexual in certain places you can only be sexual with certain people. You can only be sexual in certain ways. Yeah. Like there are all these unspoken rules around it. Yeah. And so it's like this this thing that nobody can like. It's like the the, the bogeyman in the in the corner or in the closet. We're programmed from quite young to see it as something almost dangerous. Yeah. I remember even in in sex education, we were I won't just I won't say what school it was, but um we were shown a video, maybe it wasn't school, maybe it was some other institution. And it sounds like I grew up in a cult, but we're shown some video of this American woman speaking to a crowd and essentially saying, don't have sex before marriage. Um, 
If you have sex before marriage, you devalue yourself. If you dress in a certain way, you devalue yourself. If you have these cravings, you should suppress them. Um, and I, I remember specifically saying like, if you're a girl and you dress like this, what are people gonna think of you? Um, the more sexual partners you have, the less of a person you are. And me, even, even all the way up until about 14, 15, I was a very late mature. I remember just thinking like, there is no way in hell that I wanna have sex with anyone except my wife after we're married with kids just to be safe, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, so, so I could see, and like, like as a guy, obviously I'm probably more um, inclined to, to, to be free with, with my sexuality, like just because that's the way society's set up. So I can't imagine how it is for, for the majority of, of the females in the world, n not to mention all the other genders in between that. Uh, and we live in Australia, which is one of the most liberal accepting countries in the world. So w when you extend that, uh, that thought process out to, to other countries and cultures, you can definitely see where some of these blockages come from. So, so how would one go about I don't know, re removing these, these, these blockages? Well, I advocate for self-pleasure. So do a, I. As a mode of uh, primarily coming into, first of all, coming into relationship with your own sexuality. Self-pleasure is a way... Like I see that we're all um, individual building blocks of culture. Yeah. And when you come back to the basic building block and come into relationship with yourself, yeah. then you start to see a lot of the stuff that's there that you wouldn't have access to in a conversational dynamic. When you're having sex with somebody else, it's a conversational thing. It's like, it's about the two of you coming together. It's very much a physical dialogue, isn't it? That's right. And so when you come, when you start to go in to, you know, when you go within, you access your archetypal landscape. Okay. And- I've heard the, uh, the word archetypal before. I, I still fully can't grasp what it means. Does it mean like, oh, you, you, you did the explaining. Oh, there's, there's been so much that's written about the, about archetypes. It's, you know, um, yeah, it's this idea that there are like templates. Okay. Of characters. Okay. That um, manifest in all of us as humans. So. So could you say like. A warrior is an archetype. King right. is an archetype. The queen is an archetype or the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the magician or the the witch priestess. Right. These are all kinds of archetypes. And then there's things like the wounded child and like in your experience, are there times when you sometimes feel like you're a little boy again? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's also times where, you know, if, if you do something really courageous, you feel like the warrior or, you know, if, if you pull something shifty off, you feel like the magician. Totally. And, and, and yeah, you do feel like the wounded child at times. Yeah. Um, so, so I think those kind of ide ideologies are very much within everyone and you're not ever one particular person your entire life. No, we are a tapestry of energies. We're often, you know, we spend hours in front of the TV watching other people have adventures. Yeah. And I like to say that this, that slow sex is, put, is, cre is going on the adventure of self. I love that. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes it's almost just an escape, right? Like, People are just doing it, presumably, uh, because like you said, they're, they're so busy in their lives and they're just like, oh, I'm just going to go and just jerk off to, to escape yeah. stuff and just jump into a, into a porn video yeah. and whatnot. Um, and I think, I think particularly in this day and age, porn culture is so different. There is every kind of video imaginable on the yeah. internet. The, yeah. the accessibility is ridiculous. Like if you went back, you know, even let's say 100 years and you said to a guy, um, Right now, I can look at any naked woman in the world. I've got this device where I can pull it up. They just go, "Oh my gosh, that that that's amazing! How much does it cost? Oh no, it's free. Okay, what time do I tune in? Oh, it's it's available right now. Twenty four seven. It's just like it, yeah. it's just too much power, mm. uh, and we're not built to handle that. No, and a lot of people they get their sex education from pornography. Yeah, and it's this really script. These there are these scripts that are that kind of tell us how to be in sex. So a lot of the time when people come together to have sex, they do things that they've seen in pornography. Yeah. Because uh, they think that's the way you're supposed to do that's it. That's how you're supposed to do it. And because, you know, we're all, you know, we've all got these egos and we want to yeah. look good and we want to please and we want to um, be like, like, like sexy and cool and yeah. amazing and, and, and um, you know, we want to be good lovers. Yeah. And the only example that we really have is pornography. That's that's terrifying when you think about it. Yeah, and because if, and and so pornography as a as a creator of culture, like this, it's this self perpetuating kind of 
thing. And not to mention like the, the, the deeper messages encoded in a lot of pornography, which is objectification. And yeah. There's a lot of violence and a lot of really extreme stuff gets done to women. I look back when I was in high school and I think like porn, uh, digital porn on digital format was just coming in. Mm. And like there was one CD floating around, the grade nine boys. And that was like exciting, but it, it wasn't long enough to get a full education by any means. But now... Um, every young kid's got their own phone. Everyone's yeah. got a laptop. Yeah. And I think no matter how much kind of net nanny you can install on any machine, mm -hmm. if a kid wants to see porn, they can see porn. I would love to live in a world where children did not have access to this kind of stuff, but they do. Yeah. And it's a big task to, you know, it's to, to shift, to stop that from happening. You know, like we're, we're all kind of, uh, as a parent, a mother of three kids, you know, it's something that I'm constantly aware of. I speak to my children yeah. about porn. I've asked them, you know, what kind of, you, you know, if, if they've seen things, what have they seen? And what, what I'd like for all beings, not, not just children, is for all of us to have a kind of a return to innocence. Mm. And that's very much a, what the slow sex movement is about. It's about coming back into a really curious, expansive, wondrous state. By the way, your pace is just the most chilled energy I've ever, ever experienced in my life. <laughs> like I could just see you being in a car accident and be like, well, these things happen. <laughs> <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine you ever getting frantic or, uh, or flustered about anything. I suffer, I have suffered severe panic attacks. That was part of my, my breakdown was, was these panic attacks where I would not sleep for like four days and I had a baby who was breastfeeding and I was having to drive my kids to, you know, half an hour to school each morning and not sleeping and like terrified that I was going to crash my car. And this was after my marriage breakdown and my, it was that, this is really the, the event that led to like my awakening. Um, my ex-husband the night before my daughter was born he went into a psychosis and at that time I had, you know, I wasn't the, the person that you see now at that time. I was like normal. I mean, of course you weren't that person. Now. That is so heavy. Yeah. I mean, that is so much to deal with and the so, night before your daughter was born. Yeah. And so at the time, like, I didn't really have a framework to understand psychosis as anything other than this person that I love has just like departed reality. But what he was experiencing was an awakening and he and I still, ha we can't really talk about that time. And so it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, a challenging kind of thing. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who've had experiences like this. Um, I'm sure there is. And yeah. on that note, can you give any advice for someone who's either going through the psychosis or, you know, someone who has a loved one going through, through something similar? We have this idea of reality as a fixed thing. And it's not, and there's not really such a thing as truth. There are 7 billion truths in the yeah. world. And I guess trust to the process that you're in, seek support, don't suffer alone. Um, I think there is, a, um, there is a stigma around mental illness to kind of be embarrassed about it and to shy away and don't even seek help, even if someone like, you know, close to you is going through something. Don't tell anyone about it. Keep it hush hush. Mm. Don't shame the family. Don't shame your name. Um, and and I, I've been through something not identical to that. Uh, and anyone I know who's been through something similar, how they got out of it was seeking help, was, was going to talk to people about it. Yeah. Even if it's not a psychologist straight away, find someone who's gone through something similar. These days with the internet, it's, it's such a great thing that you can find someone who's gone through something very, very similar, if not the exact same thing as you. Mm. And when you start reading about, oh, wow, this person had the, the, the same thing happen to them, like to the granular detail of like that symptom. And he, I was actually told the same sentence and I felt that exact, you know, same part of my body feel that way. It's just like, oh man, that, that's just takes a massive weight off your shoulders. And then you work out how to process it. That's true. Although I found, I was reading the internet at the time that my ex-husband was in psychosis and he was then diagnosed as bipolar and you know, all of these ideas around m what mental health is like, that there's this fixed idea of like normal and like it's it's just not a thing. Yeah. Like we're all, we're all on a spectrum of crazy 
Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. There's no normal we should all be trying to be. It doesn't work like that. No, no. And so this idea that, yeah, that mental health that you should like hide, there's no normal. Yeah. Yeah. So I was reading things on the internet and that was actually triggering my anxiety further because I was reading these bipolar websites where people were talking about how they were supporting their partner through stuff and just the kind of abusive stuff that there's, so it, the, there's so that side like, of the internet as well that can, they can just scare the living daylights yeah, out of you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, th- I think that it's like for me, having had a baby, I was I was at risk of post post um, postnatal psychosis. Oh wow! And risk postnatal depression, all sorts of stuff. And my doctor actually said that to me in uh, an appointment, and that that scared the shit out of me. I bet it did. And that actually triggered me. And so it's, it's so, you know, it's so hard to know how to navigate, not only navigate that stuff, but to support people through stuff. I think a lot of, I think we need to trust to one another more. And, you know, we live in this really kind of isolating and isolated situation where we're in our little boxes and we, we don't have a lot of connection with one another. And so I would say more than get help when you're suffering, build connection now build when you're well build connection with friends if you know if you're in your family you know families there's so much so much crazy dynamic so many crazy dynamics go on in families and i i advocate for families to do this as well that yeah speak you know we, we often get quite passive aggressive with each other yeah especially around christmas yeah it's it's hardcore uh and so yeah i think that's a great idea you know so many times if something's really on my mind i don't want to talk about it with anyone except an absolute stranger. Mm. Like, and I find so often people actually open up to Uber drivers. Yeah, yeah. So like so many times I've been on an Uber and he'll be like, where are you off to? I'm like, work. And then you just be like, I hate my job. Uh, there's this woman at work that just does my head in. Um, That's brilliant. This and this and this, and this mm. happened in my childhood. And I always wanted to be this, but I'm stead on this. And they listen and, and it's like, man, you get out of the car and you're like, oh, well, I'm glad I told someone that. That's a great idea, actually. Maybe a, a Wednesday night, strangers the stranger circle i think that i think that'd be fantastic it's a really cool idea because you don't say certain things around your cousin or your friend you've known for a long time even though you might think oh you know they're my friend they don't judge me it's like well i still want to i don't know maintain a certain image or i don't want them to know that about me because like they were there at that time and i was acting differently i think that'd be awesome like like when i open up to uber drivers i just think i've never met this person Chances are he's never going to see me again. I can just air out all my dirty laundry. And quite often they open up as well. Yeah. Like they just go, oh man, you know. Vulnerability invites vulnerability. Oh, absolutely. But I should say that I actually live from a place of radical honesty. Radical honesty. Where I do tell my family, my close, the people close to me, you know, there's, I don't. You don't hold back. I don't, I don't hold back. Has that ever got you in trouble? It creates trust because when you start to share and not in a, you did this to me and you're an asshole because of it way, when you're like, I'm feeling really challenged because I feel unsupported and it's not in an accusatory way, it's just like owning how I'm feeling, then they start to build a, a picture of your inner landscape mm. and you begin to build a picture of their inner landscape. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just would find, I would find it hard to be honest. Like I'm not saying I'm, I wear a mask the whole time, but... For example, if I see, if I have a female friend and um, she's like, what do you think of this outfit on me? I'm going to tell her it looks great either way. Yeah. Um, have you ever told Tom, you know what, you got a haircut and I don't particularly like it or something of that manner? More like I've told my sister that, I've told my sister things like you parked in the driveway you keep on parking in that same place in the driveway and I want to turn there. <laughs> yeah. And then she's like, oh, my God, I had no idea that that was such an issue yeah. for you. And now I can, like, better work with you yeah. in this dynamic. You know, it's a lot better to do that than to bottle it all up and then, like, you know. At, at, well, at, that's at, what at, creates at, the tension holding patterns in your birthday, body. At birthday, you're just exactly. like, you know what? You used to park in my spot and I've yeah. hated you for decades because of that. Yeah, yeah and, th- and that's what it creates holding patterns that's in the right. body. Yeah, that's right. And all, those things also create these layers of self-judgment and it's self-judgment that stops us from doing the things that we long to do and that we long to be. 
Yeah. And so those tension holding patterns, they, they hold us back. Mm. And so as you release them, then you have more capacity to live the life of your dreams. You know, yeah. Honestly, I have, I have the odd built up grudge. I'm so bad with it. I, I hold grudges for long, really? long times. Yeah. I, <laughs> this is actually not funny at all. I literally have a list of people that I want to like. You've got a dungeon. I have a dungeon. So think about how much energy you're expending in keeping those people in the dungeon. Yeah. Are a, you in your own dungeon? I, I'm probably in there with them because of it. it's a lot of maintenance. Like I'm still down in the dungeon guarding it when really I could be up in the castle running around having a good old time. Yeah. I always told myself the only way I'd actually clear them off the list is if I kill them, but maybe I need to just kill those thoughts. Yeah, well, you're the one who's missing out on that energy. And that's what happens is when those tension patterns release, we actually physically have more capacity. We physically have more capacity to do the things that we want to do. Yeah. It's so hard though. It's so hard. You know, like, like it almost, but, it almost but, becomes a part of you. It's, it's, like, not a, it's not a matter of like just letting it go. It's like create a process where you, you know, that you've, you've got this incredibly soundproofed room. It's true. You can scream and like, like punch pillows and like yeah. get pool noodles and smash a chair, like get really fucking angry. Yeah. Sorry if I'm not allowed to swear. I can beat that out. Don't okay. <laughs> so it's, it's not about like not having the feeling. It's about expressing the feeling. That's what the slow sex movement is about as well. It's creating these spaces where we get to really feel our feelings because we so almost never have the opportunity to do that in our society. We've drifted so far away from our animal instincts. Yeah. I think in all of us is like just a horny beast that wants to run around climbing, killing, shagging, building, like primal instincts. Yeah. And we are very much animals. We are human animals. Yeah. yeah, And it's like, by all means, we, we do need social civility and you need to act like a human being. You can't run around uh, pillaging and stealing and breaking and, and mounting people. But um, I think you do need to have a release. And that, that's why like, I don't know, I think there's a- there's So as long as you're not directing it at somebody, it's safe to feel your feelings and express them. Mm. And so if we start to create, have you seen those um, spaces, I think in Singapore, the the smash, smash the room up rooms where you can go and like smash computers with baseball bats and stuff like that. Like you can create that kind of thing for yourself at home. We can all do that and that's self-therapy. And if everybody was letting off a bit of steam yeah. at least once a week, and inviting a bit more pleasure into their life, having a bit more bliss. Yeah. I think that a lot of the problems that, you know, we're all suffering from would would kind of dissipate. Lessen. Yeah. They would they would lessen, yeah. Even like what about just smashing a boxing bag once a week? Like getting it yeah. all out, taking it all out there. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said. But you've got to really consciously connect with the with the feeling of anger for towards that person who did that thing to you. Mm. while you're bashing the bag. You can't just like emptily bash the bag. Yeah. It's like let yourself find that anger. Let let that let whoever it was, what part, whatever part of you that experienced that betrayal or whatever it was, let that per, let that part of you be present. Let that per, part of you be the one who is bashing the bag. So how did the snake tattoo come to be? We're jumping around so much. Uh yeah, the snake tattoo I I'm the kind of person I'd like to be different. <laughs> yeah. You've got to be unique. You've got to have your own brand. Yeah. And it came to me, this idea of a snake, and I saw that there's a lot of medicine in the snake for, there was for me in terms of transformation, shedding skins. Um, you know, if you've ever seen a snake or handled a snake, the way they, there's so much power in the part of them, that the, in the part of it that is connected to the earth. And the rest yeah. of it's like just kind of chill and their, their capacity for strike, to know when to act, to for stillness. You know, there are all of these different things or aspects to snakeness yeah. that were profoundly um, that were profound kind of markers for me. And so I was identifying with this energy. And it's also um uh um a symbol of w wisdom. Like I think in in dreams, if you get bitten by a snake, it's like the accepting of wisdom. And all those things you said about a snake, they're all so true. I never looked at a snake that way. They are, um, I used, I'm obviously like, like any other human being, I'm terrified of snakes, but they do know when to act. They do know when to be completely still. They do have incredible power. 
Um, like they can like suffocate human beings and like yeah. crush small deers. How long did it take just out of curiosity? That was six hours. Oh, wow. Painful? Yes, but I enjoyed it because at the time that I had it done, it was such a luxury to have six hours to myself. And then to be there in this process of really consciously marking myself in this way, it was like a completion. I would get a tattoo, but my uh, my parents would smack the Greek out of me if I had a drop <laughs> of ink on my skin. Um, taking it back to slow sex, what can someone listening to or watching this take away? Like, what's a actionable they, they a could practice. do? A practice. Oh, there's so many juicy ones. If you're a woman, dancing for yourself in the mirror every day. And I'm, when I say dance, I'm not like don't do like the moves that you do at the nightclub, like. Put on a song that you, that you emotionally triggers you, that speaks to you and let your body move in the way that it wants to. Yeah. And it might not look like dancing. It might look like making shapes or it might look like banging your fist on the, con- on the carpet. Like just see if you can hear what your body wants to do. My dancing has been described as seizures. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> not, not when you're trying to dance with someone and they're on the yeah. verge of calling an ambulance. That's that's true. Um, so actually I, I advocate for dancing dancing for everybody, not just women. That's like, and you know, if, you, if you've got kids, dance with your kids every day. Yeah. Dancing is, the, is, I think, such a good expression of fun. I mean, you don't dance when you're angry. Like, and I think it's cyclical. If you're happy, you dance. If you're, dance, if you're dancing, you're going to be happy. Yeah. You're going to have a blast yeah. and feel silly and feel, yeah. I mean, you're not going to feel silly if you're alone. That's the thing. Like just go nuts. And that's, that's the thing about being alone. That's the whole point of being alone is that you, you will do things that you would be afraid to do in the company of other people. And so the thing about sex is we, we almost can't be, do things beyond the script, beyond the, the routine, because we're afraid of how that might be received. Mm. And so if you spend some time practicing being what you truly are or pr- practicing asking for something or practicing singing, you know, practicing whatever it is on your own, you create the space to step into a more fuller version of yourself, whether it's with singing, sex or dancing. Awesome. Yeah. What can couples do in terms of slow sex? Create playlists, set aside, you know, at least two hours each week to explore non-goal-based intimacy. Offer massage. I'm going to, like, I'll offer you a massage for an hour. Mm. In that time, you don't have to to give anything back. You can just receive. Because, you know, a lot of time in sex, it's it's almost like this, okay, you did something and now I've got to do something. Like, we're always, like. Yeah, it's like a tennis game back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, and you never, and so you can never quite drop in and just let, the the deep relaxation to occur. There's, n- nobody has enough foreplay. Yeah. There's there's no such thing as enough foreplay. It's like you can always spend more time just touching. And so, like for couples, recognizing that you are always in foreplay. Start with the dishes. <laughs> Start by doing the dishes. <laughs> the dishes is foreplay. That's uh, look. Look, I like that because I think I think the sex of any relationship is a microcosm of the bigger relationship. If you're arguing, obviously you're not going to be having sex or you're going to be having substandard sex. If you guys are in the honeymoon period, if you guys are, it's someone's birthday, you're just truly in love, Mm. you know, you're doing all these cool novelty dates. The sex is amazing. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. I I think doing the dishes, I mean, I hate doing the dishes, but I'll do the dishes um, would, yeah, make the sex better. I like that, that the whole relationship. Yeah, it's, it's all one big landscape that you're playing within and create magical space like aesthetics matter and lighting matters and music matters and make a sensual experience, bring chocolate, bring uh, uh, beautiful oils. The more that you engage more, more of your senses, the more embodied and the more present you will be. Do things like get feathers and blindfold one another and create sensory kind of uh, adventures. Mix it up. Yeah. Have variation, do new things. Play, you know, play. This is where we as adults get to play. That's, that's, that's sex. That's that's a really good point. We don't have playgrounds anymore. We don't, we're not so much into into video games. The playtime is the bedroom. Yeah. So make an effort to enjoy it. Louisa Miranda, an absolute honor to meet you. Thank you so much. Plenty of actionables out of that. I've learned a lot. 
Hope you guys have as well. Thank you so much for coming into West Enders. Thank you. West Enders.